I am so happy to be here. I met Aubrey nine years ago looking for cures for kids. And that's pretty cool because two years later, I was so embedded and so invested in the longevity industry that I took two gene therapies to treat my own biological aging. And I did it to see if this technology actually worked. And um, after that, um, we proceeded with my company, BioViva. We got a lot of interest in the medical tourism sector. We really wanted to participate. We actually legally couldn't treat patients. Um, that was a shame because we literally have thousands of people reach out to us every year. People who have kids that are dying, people who have family members who are dying, and people who are dying themselves. So finally, I, I caved in and got interested in medical tourism. I saw it as a burgeoning industry and a burgeoning proof of concept arena. I decided to do, do an MBA about uh, two and a half years ago, and for my thesis, I wrote about this experience. That projected me into what I call best choice medicine, and it's something that I hope to initiate globally with governments worldwide. And it actually took off and got a lot of interest. And what it is, is it's a platform for pa helping patients tomorrow by helping patients today. Um, you won't be surprised that coming from me, it's a radical shift in thinking. Uh, not so much for me, but maybe for you. But the truth of the matter is, is we have a lot of drugs available already, okay? So a lot of people are still researching things. Maybe you're getting to the point where you would like to try drugs and your drugs in humans because you're seeing a lot of evidence. But for over a decade, we have had evidence in this space, even in the gene therapy space, that there is technology that could be saving people's lives. That is my number one key concern. I love people, and I want them to live a long time because they're amusing, they're fun, and we have a lot of great experiences together. But what started this whole journey of mine was uh, the top right-hand corner is uh, my son being diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And so sometimes when we're doing research and when we're running companies, we are vastly removed from disease. But I'll tell you what, it's a daily part of my life. Every single day we are managing this disease. And watching my parents get older and having my grandparents die was a very, uh, I have a lot of empathy. It was a very, very hard process for me. And even if you think right now that this, this technology will happen in your lifetime and people will get access to this technology in your lifetime, let me tell you, your lifetime goes fast. Again, nine years ago, I was at one of Aubrey's conferences and just learning about this technology. And the movement since then has actually been quite slow. My company has put out two peer-reviewed papers about what happens in medical tourism with patients, but I think that we can do better, and we can do better if we get government support. So why do we need a new regulatory route? Well, we need it because people who are terminally ill are not getting access to new medicine. And the medicine that you're prescribed is over 15 years old at best, okay? You guys know how fast this, the, the speed, the rate of new development in this arena is happening. We're in the gene therapy space. I mean, if we put a drug into regulations, regulatory authority right now, we would have something better by next year and two years from then. We're already combining genes. We're now working on a, a multi-combinatorial gene therapy delivery system. I mean, this is, this is going so fast. But these people right now matters. Over 100,000 people this year, it matters. There's a lack of innovation and regulation to top it off. The regulatory system doesn't really have a way to deal with treating aging. So yeah, you, like me, we choose a disease of aging and an endpoint, and then we test for a whole bunch of other things as, as secondary endpoints, right? So, but that system really isn't um, that great. It's not that streamlined. And if you look at the clinical trial system, we have a lot of monogenic um, treatments entering the system, but we don't have a lot of aging-associated treatments, okay? Things that hit multiple mortalities. Animal data is not always the best, you guys. I am really sorry, but anyone who knows me, 
um, knows that if you tell me, oh, what you expect from me is more mouse data, I, I, you're, you're not going to get a very friendly face. And we're gonna talk about that in a minute, okay? People are dying. The, the evidence for you know, just a couple of the gene therapies that we work with, telomerase reverse transcriptase and folostatin, they have meta-analysis across multiple labs. People are using them. I've even met people at the conference who are now using them in their experiments as well. Okay, the, the evidence is there. Uh, new and more precise treatments lack funding. We're going to talk about you know, the desert where a lot of companies actually go to die. We don't want that to happen to you. If you have innovation, we want you to be using it. We don't want to have to have people travel to other countries. We would like them to be able to use it right here in Ireland, right in the United States, right in the UK, wherever they're located. Okay, because that's important. So un over 150,000 people will die today of various diseases. Some people will die of aging associated diseases. As we know, aging associated non-communicable diseases are responsible for over 74% of deaths globally. But vastly, the regulatory system is not taking this seriously. Okay, our loved ones deserve the dignity to try drugs, okay? I don't know about you, but I've actually lost people in my family, and most of the time, they don't actually get the right to access drugs. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you know this, but if you're over 80, you don't even qualify for 99.9% .9 of clinical trials that are aging-associated trials. You can't even get in. It's a dallies and qualies situation. Your lifespan is not considered long enough to qualify for a very, very expensive clinical trial, even though people die in their 60s. So that is a major problem. And another problem, probably bigger than all of the problems, is that universities are sitting on hundreds of thousands of patents in their basements, in their databases, that are not translating to the public sector because we constantly wait for private funds to get those innovations forward. That was the first problem. Did you get that? <laughs> That's big. The second problem is reducing the cost of testing. So clinical trials are massively expensive. Today, it's considered a $2.6 billion cost to get one drug through regulations. Nobody has that. Every company has to look for a buyout from a bigger company in which you hope has the altruism to actually get your drug through to people. And mostly it doesn't happen. As a matter of fact, any of your competitors can probably watch and wait for you to fail because even if you make it through phase one, you've got to raise for phase two and then phase three. So it is very, very expensive. And one of the reasons it's very expensive is because the undue amount of animal studies that need to be done. It's great to have toxicity data, okay? I think that that should be a basic requirement of any drug. But we go to all ends. I just talked to a company, oh, about four weeks ago. I was on a, a, a pickup soccer team. The guy's company had raised over $100 million just for their animal studies. And they were just entering clinical trials for an indication that they didn't even want to do, but it was something they could get into clinical trials and get the drug used in humans. Okay, the problem with these mice and it's fantastic, we do wild type mice and we try to do longevity studies, it's massively expensive. But they're not really a good, um, they're not humans. Their environment is different. Their stressors are different. The model of disease are just absolutely bastardized. If you're looking at things like kidney disease or, or different dementias or things that these mice don't get, they're actually developed into these lines of mice, but not in a way, not by the mechanistic ways that they happen in humans. So that's why we spend all of this money on these preclinical testing, and the drug fails in clinical trials. People could come forward and take the place of this mouse data and actually get us data today, and I can tell you there are enough people willing to do it. They reach out to my company all the time. How we're different. 
So we would provide patients access to newer technologies than would be allowed in expanded or compassionate use access. Right to try is now a law in all 50 states in the US. Yeah, it's the US, but I mean, that's where I did my research. But right to try does not give you access to any drug that hasn't been through phase one. It's millions and millions and millions of dollars to get to phase one, okay? The requirements are too high for most companies. We would not require FDA authorization. We would take care of that in, under informed consent. And I don't know if you've ever read it, but the Helsinki Protocol number 37 actually gives people the right to try these drugs and doctors the right to give them. It's the law. We also bring all stakeholders and allow for self-reporting because the idea is to not fight with the regulatory system, it's to work with it, trust me. You'll hear a lot of stories about me that aren't true. I'm not against the regulatory system. I'm 100% for safe drugs, even though we don't have any. Who are the stakeholders to the BCM? The stakeholders, number one, is the patient, and you will all eventually be a patient. Number two, medical doctors. A lot of medical doctors actually have designed their own protocols, but they are willing to step up and use other people's protocols. Number three, academic uni uh, universities, okay, academic institutes, they can bring all of that technology and start to get that technology into humans. It's called translational medicine. Translational engines in universities is one of their top priorities right now. Probably a smaller sector is biotech companies because there's so few of us that can actually survive out here in the very deep waters. Clinics and hospitals, they can get involved and actually become a mecca, a center for where people get to go to actually advance experimental medicine. In my research, we actually found that everyone who participated in offshore experimental medicine, very cutting edge, not one of them thought that they would live to see a cure for aging. All of them did it for altruistic reasons. That's how they reported. And that's pretty amazing. And what was more amazing is almost not one of them considered themselves a high risk taker. Because when you're diagnosed with a disease, you understand that it comes with 100% mortality. It's about leaving the world a better place if we have to leave it at all. I know you don't want to. But if we do, it should be left a better place. The number one uh, stakeholder in this is probably the least obvious, but it's the governments around the world. The US government, if we delayed aging by one year, which my, my paper was based on aging-associated non-communicable diseases, would save $38 trillion if they delayed aging by one year. I think we can do better than that. So how would it work? Uh, first of all, identify candidate treatments. That's just number one. I'm sure everyone's got one or five or 10 things on the top of their head. Uh, stakeholders submit their information. Review boards go over it. The BCM is, will not accept any money from anyone who actually submits uh, as a patient or as any stakeholder um, in the situation. It will all be privately funded. Review boards will not pass or fail drugs. So nobody is at risk at participating. Uh, back on the last slide, you know, expanded access. People get use of compassionate care. There is so much paperwork for people to do that people die waiting to get access. In Right to Try, did you know that they don't even have to report on if the drug worked or not? So if you're terminally ill, you go find a, a drug that got through phase one. You want access to it. Well, 100 other people with your same condition might have done that and died, and you wouldn't know it. Our review boards will keep up on that, keep up on what's happening with these drugs, and only dangerous drugs will be removed. A fail, like you know, not treating a disease, could come down to titration or needing to choose the right condition. 
So the database with summaries would be open for everyone, and then patient access happens, and from patient access with successes or failures, either the drug is put into the bin, it's re-examined you know, re uh, for a different use, or it's a success, and we hope that it stays with the BCM for more access, because clinical trials limits the access of people who can get access to these drugs and then it can take off in the regulatory system. So our hope is to have a handshake across the aisle, risk, removing the risk that the FDA has right now or the regulatory bodies like the, the EU, um, and actually create a system where they get drugs with human data, de-risking the whole system for everyone. So again, we're going to identify a candidate that can come from a university, a, a biotech, a, a, a medical doctor, and so on. Or we could repurpose drugs. The stakeholders submit their information. Patients will not be reviewed. They just need a diagnosis. The, the thing is, is we have to get back to medicine where a medical doctor and a patient consent. There doesn't need to be regulatory overview past that. It's between these two people. The review board goes over it. The review boards are specialized for everything. For instance, I am not qualified to be a reviewer. These will be people who are at the top of their field. Database summaries will be open to everyone who participates in the system. Patients can report on their successes or failures. Drug companies can do the same, and we can expedite the use of these drugs or the movement in towards uh, directions in which the drugs will work. Patient access, I have been through this. When I went through gene therapy seven years ago, and I have again since then, but I was much more cautious the second time, and I thought we did a good job the first time, I had no idea how hotly debated this would be, that this one action that I did would be, you know, over the media with a million opinions on, on what I did. I mean, people really uh, got a bit crazy about it, so people are pretty nervous about participating in these things, but medical tourism is super streamlined, it's super safe, it's super anonymized, and it's going quite well. And for people in the audience who are worried about longevity medicine only being for the rich, right now it is. Think about that for a minute. Again, another review, getting the, the drug back in the system or out of the system, and then take off velocity. Your drug goes to regulatory system with actual human data. And guess what? This is legal. It actually works. We deal with doctors all the time. One of our doctors just got $50 million in funding for his uh, cancer therapy because it is recognized as uh, appropriate data. It just depends on how you do it. We want to reach out with this globally. We are looking for delegates in different countries in the world who can talk to their regulatory bodies and start the discussion. This is not something that is happening right now. This is a proposed idea. It's got a ways to go, and we really hope that you support it. Because let's face it, people need medicine. People young and old are dying today. You will die eventually of a disease if we don't do something quickly about it. There's no sense in coming and getting excited and talking about things if we're not actually using these drugs. We want to help patients in need now. This is, this, this is more in my heart than it ever was before. After starting a company that said, OK, this is it, we're going to do it, and then not being able to do it, Absolutely heartbreaking. Seven years, almost 41 million people die every year of aging that had a hope that we would do something. We would somehow get them access, and we never legally could do that. We need legal access for patients now. There are a lot of nonprofits and organizations that will come forward to pay for these studies. We had a nonprofit come forward to, for the treatment of five people with dementia, and that paper is out peer reviewed you can get the information out there. We want to find new drug candidates, and this is the only way to do it. A mouse is not going to tell us whether a drug is really working or not, OK? It may work in a mouse. Doesn't mean it'll work in you. We need to translate medicine. We've got to get it out of research, and we've got to get it into people, and we've got to create an open network for all of the stakeholders. 
We need to stop having to put our hands out for doing the right thing and actually be giving out drugs. Uh, <laughs> okay, I better, better be careful how I say that, but getting drugs out to, to the public and, and really meeting our mission. So <laughs> we want to find solutions for today's problem. And each and every one of us has to look inside of us. And we have to decide the world that we want to live in. It's not a world of money. It's a world of abundance. You know, I always say that, you know, health, health should be free. Now, human enhancement, that's what you'll be paying for me, me for in the future. Because <laughs> that's what I want to do. I want to make you stronger, smarter, and faster on top of living a really long time. So in conclusion, the BCM plan proposal here could give millions of people access to technological advancement earlier in drug development than is currently available, OK? This is the key point to what I am proposing here. It's starting to get a lot of inertia. I know it may seem like a radical idea, but I believe it's the only way forward to see these drugs in our lifetime. I want to thank you for listening and get back to solving the awesome problems that you're working on.